without awkward start, I just want to welcome everyone to our last uh, few computational science um, collaboration working groups webinar for 2015. Uh, it's a continuation of our series, uh, our March to the March uh, 2016 Computational Science Symposium. And I think we have a really good agenda for you today. We have a little bit of a preview if you do attend the 2016 CSS of so what the FDA session uh, might look like or will look like. We have a, one of the presenters here from the FDA. We also have uh, a new session at the uh, 2016 CSS. It'll be a workshop on Semantics 101 for Pharma, and we have one of the uh, co-leads of that uh, workshop here to kind of give us a little bit of an overview of that today. And if we have time, I just want to talk to some of the accomplishments that uh, the working groups have put forward here in uh, 2015. So before we get started, I just want to go through uh, a few housekeeping items. So all of the people that uh, have joined the webinar are actually on mute. And if you do have questions uh, during the uh, course of this session, uh, either for, for Crystal, Tim, or myself, um, please feel free to uh, type them in or enter them into the GoToWebinar question functionality, and we'll actually get to all of your questions at the end of the session. But please feel free as you think of something or as you have a question for one of our presenters, do enter it into the GoToWebinar, and like I said, we'll get to those uh, at the end. And if we don't, um, actually uh, uh, run out of time to address your questions. We will take those offline and answer those offline. And anything that we do offline as well as the presentations themselves and the recording of the presentation will actually be posted to the FUSE website. So those, the recording and the presentations are typically posted about a week after uh, the webinar. So if you have colleagues that were not able to attend or you had a question that um, we weren't able to get to, uh, please visit the FUSE website and um, we will uh, have the recording and the answers to your questions posted on the website. So before I actually turn the presentation over to, uh, to Crystal and Tim, I just wanted to highlight a few of the important dates for our 2016 Computational Science Symposium. So the event itself will occur in beautiful Silver Spring, Maryland, or I'll keep my fingers crossed that it'll be beautiful this year as opposed to the three inches of snow we had a couple of years ago. So that, that will actually take place on March 13th through the 15th in 2016. Registration is now open, and if you register before January 29th, there is actually a discounted rate, so uh, please try to uh, take advantage of that before uh, January of next year. We actually already have 100 folks that have uh, registered for the conference, and we do have a hard cap at 300, so um, typically registration doesn't go this fast. However, there, there's been a pretty high demand this year, so that's, that's really good. So I would advise, if you are interested in attending the conference, um, do register early, because again, as I mentioned, we have uh, a hard cap at 300, so again, if you are interested, I would recommend trying to uh, register before uh, most folks take a break uh, for the holidays. So uh, the last date that I just want to uh, make people aware of is we do have a poster session at the 2016 CSS, and all, all entries for posters are due uh, by January 15th. So if you are interested in the poster session, um, please uh, get your posters in to us uh, by January 15th. So I am now going to turn the presentation over to Crystal. And well, she's getting set up. I am just going to give a, a really brief introduction. So Crystal is a special assistant to the director of the Office of Computational Science and CEDAR at the FDA, or OCS. So over the last year or so, OCS has been loading data into their clinical trial repository. And then since then, there's been some kind of common loading errors that they've noticed. And what Crystal is here today is to share some of the, the loading errors as opposed to some other information about um, the OCS's efforts loading content into their uh, clinical trial uh, repository. So without further ado, I am going to uh, turn the presentation over to Crystal and let her have the floor. Hi, folks. Uh, as Scott said, my name is Crystal Allard, and I work in the Office of Computational Science, which is in CTER at FDA. And uh, we're taking this marching to march title uh, sort of seriously in our office. I wanted to let you know that um, we're, we're already working on the theme for all of the information that we're hoping to share at the March conference, and we see this as 
as step one. Um, so what we're hoping to do is, is help uh, you know attendees of the Peace Conference get you know gather an understanding of what we are seeing here at FDA specific to data standards. Um, we think that the Jumpstart team and and I'm the program manager for the Jumpstart service here at FDA. The Jumpstart team is sort of uniquely positioned to to gather data on the types of data quality issues and uh, data formatting errors that we're finding here at FDA. And we want to make sure that we're sharing those. So we're doing it in a number of ways. Um, and I'm going to go through what all of that is you know, a little bit in a, in a minute. But I also want to make sure that folks know that um, if there's something that I speak to today that is of particular interest, please feel free to contact me and tell me that you'd like to hear more about it. Or if there's something I don't mention and, and you'd like to hear more about it, we'd be happy to hear from you because we are planning the information that we're going to share at FUSE and we're going to be presenting posters and speaking and participating. Um, and we want to make sure that we're giving folks as much information as we can in, in the way that they want it. So don't hold back. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, the, the Clinical Trials Repository is also called the CTR, it's also called Janus, it's also called the Janus CTR. Um, I tend to use them all interchangeably. <laughs> so um, any of those three versions are, are all the same thing. It's a data warehouse that was designed at FDA for subject level clinical trial data. It was developed jointly with NCI and it's been operational here at White Oak since last January. We in fact just had a production release today, this morning. Um, and we're very excited because we're going to start using the CTR on a routine basis starting today, which is a, kind of a big deal for us. If anyone is interested in knowing more about the conceptual model, it's based on the bridge and it's publicly available. Uh, you can get to it from the links here. The, the model is posted on our FDA website for anyone to see. It's designed to receive uh, SDTM data, but it can also support other study data, uh, study data exchange standards, including SEND, HL7v3, HL7FIRE, and RDS standards. Uh, we also have the study data validation rules published on the study data standards resources page. So the validation rules for both SDTM and SEND submissions to FDA are published on, the, on that web page. I, I spoke to Tim about this for a, a brief second yesterday and we discovered that there might be some inconsistencies with the validation rules that are published on the web page and the feedback that folks are getting as part of the test submission. Um, I don't really want to speak more to that. I just want to make a note that we, we learned about that yesterday um, and we're looking into it and we plan to address it. So the, the study data validation rules may end up being updated to make sure that we're matching what we're finding uh, with the tool called DataFit, which is very closely aligned with the free open source open CS tool. And then here's the link to download the CTR conceptual model if you're at all interested. So for the last year or so, we have been, ha you know, we've had access to the CTR and we've been able to load data to it. So the way that we did it was we started by loading all data from all applications that received the Jumpstart service in 2014 and 2015. So what that means is all of the applications that received the Jumpstart service, all of the studies that were included in Jumpstart have been loaded. Um, what's different from that and what we're going to start doing, we actually started about a month ago, is that any Jumpstart application that receives a service will now be loading all of the SDTM data files in that application. So where previously, if, if the, um, the application had 13 SDTM studies, the Jumpstart service is limited to four. We only do a maximum of four. We average probably two to three studies for a Jumpstart service. So previously, we were only loading what was included as part of the Jumpstart service. But now we're loading all SDTM data associated with any application that receives the Jumpstart service. And the goal is to start loading all SDTM data received at FDA loaded to the CTR. So um, that should be happening by next year. We're going to use this year to really build our process for loading to the CTR and work out the, the errors that we're finding and what we need to do about them as we find them. So here are the stats. In the last year, 
we have only <laughs> moved our success rate from 100% from failure to 77% failure to load. Um, I'll go through the, the exact errors that are causing this in a minute, but when we first started loading data last winter, 100% of our attempts failed. Um, by September of this year, which is when we created this slide, 77% of our attempts failed. We had a major dip in May. We were pretty successful in loading in May. We also had um, fewer studies loaded. So just of note, the, uh, the load attempt failures are on the first try because we didn't want to include or skew the numbers by including every time that we attempt to load. It generally takes two to three times to load a study uh, before it passes. We understand that the second and third times are generally more reflective of the warehouse than they are of the data quality issues. So of the studies that we've tried to load, eight of them, which is equivalent to 5%, didn't load to Janus at all. Uh, they can't be loaded. Um, and without some major work, we won't load them. Four of those studies couldn't load because they're missing design files. And four of them have significant data issues that can't be fixed uh, without more information from the sponsor. And as I said, we're going to use this year as a means of learning what the appropriate response to this type of a data issue is and to start setting rules, right? So we'll be going through the kinds of errors that are preventing us from loading and determining whether or not it's worth discussing with the sponsor. The reality is that we can do the Jumpstart service without the CTR. So for now, if the data can't be loaded to the CTR, we can still do the Jumpstart service. We're unlikely to even tell sponsors whether or not um, their data was, was able to be loaded, but we're going to work through the rules for that and we'll be working with reviewers for, um, with their feedback and we'll be working very closely with OSP and OB about how to handle these, these errors that we're coming across. So we also found that 86 of the studies, which is 55%, had major blocking issues. So 65 of those studies, which is 42.7%, had issues with the defined file that prevented us from loading. 76 studies, which is 49%, had issues with the therapeutic or the trial summary domain data. Um, this is a requirement for loading into the CTR. The, every study must include trial summary information. We've, we've changed the, the error report such that there's a minimum of information within those trial summary domains that needs to be included. It doesn't have to be every single thing to get it loaded. That's just so that we can load more things, um, but we can't load without them. So 17 of the studies had sort of other miscellaneous loading issues. And uh, when we say miscellaneous, what we mean is not the defined file or the trial summary domains. And I'll go through some examples of those in a few minutes. And then 20 of the studies, which is 18%, were just completely missing trial summary domain files. Um, and last year, in the absence of a trial summary domain, we created them. This year, we're trying not to do that. It turns out we are getting more. Um, it's more frequent that we see trial summaries included, but we're not doing it as often. The major rules in uh, CTR, for um, we, re we refer to these as the CTR blocking rules. What that means is it blocks loading of the data to the CTR. So, um, any data or any yeah, data error that prevents loading to the CTR is what we would refer to as a blocking rule. So the major ones include duplicate trial element codes, and there's a description for what that means. Um, duplicate trial inclusion and exclusion criteria, duplicate trial visits, trial summary duplicate records. We also can't load if there are invalid class names for domains. Um, duplicate study ID values, we have actually seen that. Trial summary data types need to be appropriate. Trial summary uh, date times need to be in the appropriate format, and we described what that is here. The, um, the trial summary data types need to be ISO 8601, and they need to be in a duration. So we described that here also. Um, and special characters, special characters within the data set can prevent us from loading. So here are some examples of errors within a defined file or 
in with the defined file that can prevent us from loading. Um, if the study name element is the same for two different studies under the same product application number, this is a problem for us. If the XSL file is invalid, and we've we've seen that a number of times, that uh, creates an, an error when we try to create a defined file while loading. Um, data sets that are included in the study data folder, but not not included, not described in the define XML. And um, when the define XML refers to a define XSL file, it doesn't actually exist. So that reference needs to be correct. And um, an invalid class for a custom domain. So um, we need to, I mean, an example here is the findings for a domain that should be loaded as an events or an intervention domain. So those need to be appropriately labeled within the defined file. So here's a list of some trial summary errors that we've come across. Uh, treatments not associated correctly with dose and root data. Trial summary records not unique based on the TS parameter code and the TS sequence. Um, trial summary values for TS parameter codes. So the age min is sometimes a problem. It just needs to be an ISO 8601 format, but we get it um, sort of free text almost pretty often. The trial summary parameters, um, ACSEP has to be a number or it has to be null. It can't be text. The trial summary value for uh, for age max, again, needs to be in ISO 8601 format. So we sometimes see text that says unlimited, none, no maximum age. Those are not okay. Um, the randomization quotient needs to be a numerical value, and sometimes people use words to describe that. And then the trial summary parameters um, of these two need to be in either date time values and need to be in the proper 86 ISO 8601 format also. So these are the probably the most common trial summary errors and if you're interested in a very technical explanation I can provide that but it's boring. So just other examples of errors that we come across. Duplicate records and observation domains sometimes can prevent a problem. Special characters within the data sets, we mentioned that, but these are some examples that we've actually seen within the data set. Um, invalid trial design domains based on the SDTM ID. Uh, duplicate unique subject IDs in the demographics domain. We've actually seen that. Invalid date values are really common and really problematic. And non-standard variables within the submission data sets. So, um, you know, you have to follow the rules of SDTM when creating non-standard variables. If they're if they're new or unexpected, that can cause problems for us. So, we understand that that data that comes to us is likely to have some validation errors. We expect that those are described within the study data reviewers guide, but the major blocking rules, especially existence of defined files and <laughs> summary domains um, are an expectation of data that's submitted to SDA. And there are some really fairly major repercussions for us in having data with blocking errors, with major load errors. So the dream for us is to have data that auto loads from the, the EDR to Portis to the CTR. Um, right now, we have data that goes through the gateway lands in the EDR, it sometimes goes to Portis and it sometimes doesn't, depending on whether or not it's in the appropriately labeled folder. And then we have to pull it down manually to another folder to load it to the CTR. There's no auto loading. And without, um, without data that has zero blocking issues, we'll never be able to auto load data to the CTR from these three places. So, um, that's days away from a review clock that we have to deal with um, getting the data into into a warehouse, and um, it can be you know it can actually take some some fairly major time and be an annoyance for us and for the reviewers. The the other major uh, you know example here is that we do automated analyses of the data. So generally. Um, you know, if it's if it's a if the data has blocking rules, we can't do analysis on it <laughs> pretty much anyway. Um, but the goal in the next couple of months is to start using the CTR in the dumpster service. So 
we're going to actually start using the CTR to do analyses um, to provide them to reviewers as part of the Jumpstart service, and we'd like to be able to run all of the analyses if there are data errors, we run the risk of not being able to do them at all. Previously, the Jumpstart service was provided outside of the CTR, which allowed us to be able to manipulate the, the tools that we use to do the analyses. That's less easy in the CTR. So um, having good data is really actually more important when we start using the CTR than it was previously. It also you know, results in a minim minimization of information requests to sponsors. That one's fairly obvious. It also minimizes the number of versions of data, which is you know, a serious problem because having many versions of the same data with different errors can be really confusing and um, it's just not ideal for us or reviewers. Those are the major ones. I'm sure there are more. So in the next year for the Janus CTR, as I said, we're going to start using it with the Jumpstart service probably in the next couple of months. We're really hoping to be able to share some of our experience using the CTR with folks at the March conference when we get there. So we're pretty excited to um, get started and start learning more about what it's like to really use the CTR. We've been loading for a year, but we haven't been really sharing what we've been learning until now. We're also developing CTR training for reviewers, which will be rolled out in, um, in concert with the Jumpstart service as will access to the CTR for reviewers who receive the Jumpstart service. So that should be coming in the next couple of months. We're pretty excited about it. So I think we're going to hold questions until the end. And I will stop showing and give it over to Tim. Thanks so much, Crystal. So as, as Crystal mentioned, we are going to be taking questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please feel free to type them into um, the GoToWebinar uh, panel. And like I said, we will get to those at the end. Crystal, you did mention if people wanted to, to um, reach out to you uh, after the presentation and could contact you directly. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah. You know, so we're planning what we'd like to share at the, the March conference, and we'd love to hear from people about what they'd like to hear from us, particularly as it pertains to data standards, the CTR, and Jumpstart. We'll probably focus okay. on those three things. Okay. And is your, your contact information then would be in if people wanted to reach out to you, or is there a different way that people can follow up with you? Email is probably best, and it's my first name, dot my last name, at sea.hhs.gov. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'm going to let uh, Tim have the floor and give us a preview of a new workshop that will be occurring at the 2016 CSF. The floor is yours, Tim. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott and uh, Crystal. Just to confirm, Scott, and hear me okay and see my screen as well. Yep, everything looks good. Fantastic. All right. Well, as mentioned earlier, I'm going to be one of the instructors leading the workshop here along with my colleague, Mark Anderson. We are both co-leads of the analysis results and metadata project within the CS organization here. And the workshop will take place that first Sunday evening after the opening session. And we hope it will last approximately two hours. I know we will all be a bit tired and it's late in the day, but we will try our best. We will have some caffeine, sugar, and I've been promised some real food as well, so don't let that put you off at all. In terms of what we will talk about, we are going to take a very pragmatic and practical introduction to the semantic web. So we'll give you the real basics to what this technology is and what it is all about. So the basics in the background, we will stress the importance to pharma and highlight a number of examples there as well. In terms of the technologies and tool sets, because we are taking this practical approach, we choose free open source software wherever possible, and I will talk about the applications in a moment. A lot of our focus will be on the resource description framework, or RDF, which is the underlying schema. And it was a great lead into my presentation to see that RDF is going to be supported by the Janus CTR as well. So this is definitely something that many will have an interest in. Of course, once you have data in this format, you want to be able to query it. And we use the Sparkle query language and protocol for that. That could be a course unto itself, really. But we will give you the basics to get started so you can start to explore the data and learn about the data models and structure by the act of querying the data. Of course, you will also want to create your own linked data as RDF. 
and that's surprisingly easy to do, especially with some of the packages available within R. We will also show you how to do it with SAS as well. And then once you create it, there are several advantages to uploading the data to what's called a Sparkle endpoint. And that's true even if you just do this on your local machine. You can then execute what's called a federated query, bring data in from graphs on the internet and enrich in your own data. And you could also serve it to others if you wish, even within your company firewall or on your local machine. And then we'll also talk about some visualization tools so you can start exploring the nature of linked data and follow that trail of data along. And talking about traceability and trust, things very important to pharma. This will give you a lot of the background that you could then use if you choose to attend one of the various projects within the CSS symposium, and you'll have that background to be able to contribute there and know a little bit better about what's going on with this core technology. So to take a look at the various projects here within the CS, uh, just to show you it really spans the entire gamut of the data lifecycle for clinical trials data. The CDIS foundational standards in RDF, they've already delivered their standards that are available for download from the CDIS website. And we will show you how to leverage that work into some of the other workshops that are going on. And of course, our specialty here, I talk for myself and Mark, is the analysis results and metadata project. And we bring in code lists and rule sets there. So all of this becomes very interconnected. What is this semantic technology? Well, this is a view of the semantic web technology stack, or layer cake, as it is sometimes called. And a lot of the courses and online resources you will find spend a lot of time talking about the rule sets, the models, the logic, and ontologies. And those are very interesting and very vital parts of this technology stack. You can quickly become lost in this. Ontologies can become very complex. And unless you have those basics, you quickly get lost and discouraged. So we will focus much more on the basics, starting at the bottom here. The fact that it is a web-based platform using HTTP-based URIs. We will talk about the turtle format of RDF, which is much more human-readable than some of the other formats, like n triples. So RDF will be a large focus. And also the query language, Sparkle. And when you have these basics, then, you will see how they can build up into these layers of security, proof, and trust that are so vital within our industry. It really lends itself to those areas. In terms of the core concepts, everything has a name. Every data value, every piece of metadata, every property has a name. And all of these names are unique and addressable. We use HTTP URIs to form those names. You are already familiar with things like URLs. Well, a URL is a type of URI. So we are using web-based addressing here. All of these named things are linked together. And that is where we have the concept of a directed graph. And I'll show you that in just a moment. And the links between these named things have meaning. And that's where the semantics comes in to the semantic web. And while this is born in the web, it is application far beyond the web. Again, if you're just dealing with data on your laptop, there's some great advantages to using this technology. Speaking a little more in depth about RDF and what it is, it is based on the concept of a directed graph triple. So here we have a subject linked to an object by a predicate. And we make this statement that drug X has side effects dry mouth. Subject drug X is linked to dry mouth by this meaningful relation with predicate as side effects. So this is how we link bits of information together. If we view that then in turtle, which is terse RDF triple language, which is a more human readable form as I mentioned earlier, turtle defines a number of prefixes at the beginning that then allow us to define these URIs in a more readable format that looks much like the directed graph at the top of the slide. So we can make statements very clearly here that drug X has side effects drug X. Now, those very simple concepts of a directed graph triple can quickly grow into very complex ontologies and data models. So here we have a simple observation from an RDF data cube that we define as part of our working group for results data. And if we view that, here on the right-hand side, this is a network graph of a very simple demographics data cube with observations in yellow. 
and cube structure and code lists and attributes and dimensions all come together into this graph. And this graph really doesn't have a lot of utility for someone using the data, but we use graphs like these, which are very interactive and spin around and are very pretty, in our working group to make sure that we have the model correct and the uh, connections are all defined correctly as well. On a more practical level, let's take a look at this very simple demographics table. Once again, with the number of females in the placebo treatment group. And again, with our now familiar Turtle RDF format, we can now define very new and different types of graphical interactions with this, so more interactive graphs. This is a hive plot that I've made using D3JS. And we see once again this value of 12, if we put our mouse over that node or data point, we quickly see the links to the cube dimensions, which are the statistic, race, um, treatment, all of the dimensions here defined. So we can see those in sex dimension as well. And this graph is very interactive. Not only can you mouse over to see the connections, but if you were to click on one of the nodes, you could go to the underlying hyperlink data and open up what's called a fasted browser page of that information that you could then follow the hyperlinks through the data. I'm not going to demonstrate that for you today. You have to show up to the workshop to see all of that cool stuff. So that's my selling point there. Come see this graph in action. You can also make new and very interactive summary tables. So this will be very disruptive to where we are going with the display of information in the future. So here we have a very quickly made demographics table. My colleague Mark made this and he told me it was easy. So I can, I can say it's easy because I don't do it myself yet. But it's a quick view of the demographics data. And let's say, for example, that we are interested in the patients in this low dose regimen. We want to drill down and see the patients underlying that data. Because all of these points are hyperlinks, it's very easy to do so. We can pick up that data point and drag it over to a function box over here on the left-hand side, for example. And that allows us then to see all of the underlying data. So these are all of those 84 patients that were summarized in that data point. Note here that one of these columns is also a hyperlink. So we could click on that and keep following the trail of data either manually by clicking on the links or by executing Sparkle queries to follow that data trail. It's not limited just to this simple summary table of demographics. We could look at a table of adverse events, and we may be interested in the atrial flutter event here in the high-dose regimen. And we could then follow over and find more information about those individual events and further drill down for more information. All of this drill down becomes very easy to do because of the hyperlinked linked data. You don't need a very expensive application to do it. It's there as part of the data store. So hopefully I've showed you a few things that you might spark your interest in semantic web technologies and linked data. To list a few more here, it allows you to integrate very diverse data sources. You can define rule sets between uh, data silos bring that data in very easily. You can define multi-dimensional data models like the RDF data cube that we are using in our working group. And fundamental to this concept is integrated metadata and context come with the data, not just interpretable by the person reading it, but also by the machine. So it's machine-readable metadata and context. We can leverage existing standards like the CDIS standards to RDF, uh, in RDF that I mentioned already. And this will really revolutionize production of things like our submissions and the CSRs. Because we have links between data, text, and values, it really enhances our review and our trust in the data because we can simply drill down to the underlying data to check into it. We'll, we will have new ways to explore the data through very interactive data visualizations. And then all these things lead up to the very last bullet point here in this slide, the reliability and trust is so important in our industry. In terms of prerequisites for the workshop, no previous experience at all is required. If this is your first time encountering some web link data RDF, we will start with the very basics, and it will be a hands-on. So you will start to dig into an RDF file and see what a triple is like, and be able to query it, be able to upload data into this. So lots to cover, but starting at a very basic level. We will ask that you bring your own laptop, and we would like you to install some of the applications listed on this slide, although it's not an absolute requirement. 
we will likely send out a survey to potential attendees before we do this, and we will adjust our approach as needed. If we find that because we are in Pharma, many of our laptops are locked down, you may not be able to do these installations. And if you aren't, don't let that prevent you from coming to the workshop. You can follow through with our examples or perhaps look over the shoulder of someone who has these applications installed. We prefer R for much of our work. There are some good packages there that allow us to create, query, um, RDF data very easily. We will also support SAS. We will ask you to install the Virtuoso Open Source Edition as a Sparkle endpoint. And lastly, a local web service. This is probably the easiest thing to do. I use Python because it installs very easy. You could also use Apache, WAMP, LAMP, or any number of other local web services to serve up some of the data and do some of these visualizations. But again, don't be put off if you uh, aren't able to do some of these installations. In order to register, we do ask that you register prior to the workshop. There is a checkbox on the conference registration page for this workshop and the other GitHub uh, workshop the following day. I suggest try both. They both look like good sessions to me, but I'm a bit biased. And if you've already registered for the conference, as mentioned, 100 of you already have, I'm sure we can provide uh, some alternate arrangements there. And Scott, we can follow up after that later. And then above all, uh, we really hope to see you there. We hope it's a, a very useful session. We will try our best to be uh, interesting along the way as well as, as instructors. So with that, I will hand it back to Scott here as best I can. And look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much, Jim. I hope uh, for those of you that are attending the webinar that that kind of whets your appetite and it makes you uh, interested in attending uh, that session. I think it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's said as well, it's new for 2016. Um, so I think that uh, hopefully that will, it, it will definitely be well received and uh, well attended. Um, I, I, in the interest of time, I just want to go through uh, quickly some of the, the 2015 uh, accomplishments of the uh, uh, computational science working groups. Um, we have a few questions here at the end. If you do have additional questions, please feel free to type them into uh, the GoToWebinar panel and, and we will get to those. So as Tim mentioned, there is a kind of a lot going on. Um, you know, both in the Semantic Technologies Working Group as well as across uh, the entire uh, computational science collaborations and, and in, in the working groups. And just kind of want to give you just a, a little, like, kind of a brief rundown of some of the uh, things that we did uh, over the last uh, the last year, and kind of hope that you might be interested in getting involved in uh, a working group or in a project. So of course, we had our fourth annual. Uh, ASS in uh, March of this year, so March 2016 is going to mark our fifth anniversary, which uh, five years ago, I think if you would have asked if we would have made it to that point, you probably would have had a 50-50 you know, chance of, of uh, making it this far. So we've actually done a lot of good work um, in the last five years. And currently we're running about 30 active projects, so there's a lot going on within the collaboration and a lot of opportunities for you to get involved. So some of the specifics that we accomplished here in 2015, we updated uh, the SDRG and ADRG work packages, and those are available um, via the FUSE website, via our catalog of deliverables, and it'll take you directly to those work packages. Um, we completed a best practice for uh, assigning unplanned visit num and assigning epoch to subject level observations. We completed a white paper for that. There were a few analysis and display white papers that were finalized uh, during 2015, as well as uh, the adoption, uh, and Tim referenced this in his uh, presentation, there were uh, the Semantic Technologies Working Group, um, this project especially pushed forward by Frederick Malfe, uh, put together a representation of the CETIS foundational standards in RDF, and in 2015, that work package was officially adopted by CETIS. Um, in collaboration with uh, the FUSE collaboration to um, or adopted as an official CEDIS standard. So that was uh, you know, rather monumental for our two organizations. Um, so in addition to some of these finalized deliverables, we've had approximately 10 draft deliverables be reviewed and commented on by um, people outside of the collaboration as well as people uh, within the collaboration. So a lot of work you know, still going on that, that um, you know, will be final uh, coming in 2016. And I apologize to folks that may be members of the working group if I did happen to miss something that was not um, purposeful. I, I did go to uh, our catalog of deliverables to see what we've done. And um, if I did miss something, I do apologize. 
So one thing I do want to know is we're always looking for opportunities to collaborate with different um, entities within uh, the pharma and regulatory space, and we've really improved our collaboration uh, with CEDIS during the course of 2015. The um, adoption of this RDF uh, representation of the CEDIS foundational standards was just one uh, collaboration point. We've been talking to CEDIS quite a bit about other opportunities where the two uh, entities can come together and actually maximize our volunteers and maximize the effort that you put forward. So I just want to kind of, again, kind of put the call out. We still need you. We still need you to kind of help make a difference um, in some of the projects that are ongoing and some of the uh, deliverables that are being put out for, for, for review. So if you are interested in uh, participating in the collaboration, I encourage you to visit our dashboard um, on the FUSE website that summarizes all the projects that are currently ongoing uh, within the collaboration and as well as contacts uh, for those projects. So you can, if you find something you like, follow up with uh, folks like Tim or folks like Crystal and get involved in some of the projects. So now I'm just going to look at and see what questions we have. I know we had a couple. Um, this one is uh, for Crystal. So regarding the Janus CTR accepting RDF, do you happen to know which RDF schema this is based on, or it, can a sponsor submit any type of RDF structure? So I do not know which schema it's based on, but let me make a note, and I can look that up. Um, the developers can certainly tell me that. And so it's important to note that um, even though the CTR can accept, can take, you know, load files in RDF, the SEA is not currently accepting them. Um, any standard that would be accepted at FDA would have to go through a rigorous, rigorous testing process and then be listed on, um, it would be updated in the, the, oh shoot, the name is escaping me all of a sudden. It's the Excel spreadsheet that we have on our website that, that lists all of the different standards, data standards that we accept in file formats. Which? Of the data standards catalog. Yes. That's the one. The data. It's like it's okay. not the technical performance guide. It's the <laughs> any standard listed in the data standards catalog is what is accepted at FDA. And we would post an update to the data standards catalog and then um, give folks time before before accepting. Okay. Thank you. So another question for you, Crystal. Are the Janus CTR rules uh, publicly available and published uh, by the FDA? the blocking rules that you had uh, shown on one of your slides? The blocking rules are not yet published. They are in the process of being harmonized with the existing validation rules that are already on our web page. Um, they mm -hmm. should align pretty closely with the, the CDISC SCTM validation rules. Um, and it's possible that they, you know, they could end up in other and other guidance for electronic study data, but they're not yet. Do you happen to have any timelines for when those might be be published? I don't. It's a good question. Maybe I could bring that to March. Okay, perfect. And, and then a question for Tim. Uh, Tim, do you know after, the, if people are not able to attend the 2016 TSF, do you anticipate running uh, the workshop, either in its uh, current form or perhaps in a in a smaller you know, uh, version later on, as a, maybe a webinar or some type of other session. I think that's a really great suggestion. I know we've talked a little bit about the the main Fuse conference itself. We're running something in Europe as well. Um, I know something that I, I'd like to do. I think it'd be very valuable. We need to talk within the Fuse organization maybe about how to do that. But I think it's something that we should look into, and maybe something that even just ongoing to talk about the technology, where it's going, latest developments and, and updates. So I think that's a great note that I will I will take and we can discuss that uh, offline and come back with something. Good good question. Excellent. Um, so it, it doesn't look like we have uh, any additional questions. So I do want to thank the presenters for their time today. I think those were great presentations, um, and we're looking forward to both the, the workshop as well as more from hearing more from the FDA at the 2016 CSS. Again, um, we have 100 people registered and there's a 300 person cap. So if you are interested in attending the CSS, I would encourage you to uh, register here in the very uh, near term. So with that, we will 
log off from the webinar for 2015, and we look forward to seeing you in 2016, and I uh, hope everybody has a, a nice holiday season. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Scott.